This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. From 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue to City Hall, the politics of a midterm election. This is going to be a fun one. Hope you'll stick around in studio straight ahead. Could it really get any more interesting? Love him or hate him, you have to admit President Donald Trump has upended political norms like nothing we've seen in recent memory. What's more, his impact is being felt far from the nation's capital. Feelings about Trump have filtered down to the most local of local elections. On this edition of In Studio, we look at the midterm election year, analysis of what has happened so far and what the future may look like. We're joined by two journalists and two political strategists. Lisa Nelson Savage has been executive editor of the Pensacola News Journal since 2014, although her journalism career spans over two decades. Rick Alton is the owner and publisher of the N Weekly newspaper and Rick's blog. He's also a published novelist. His book is entitled City of Grudges. Ryan Wiggins is the owner and chief strategist for Full Contact Strategies, a political media consulting firm. Her political acumen has taken her from D.C. to Tallahassee. Travis Peterson is the owner and lead strategist of Impact Campaigns, also a communication and political branding firm that works with progressive candidates and the causes. Welcome. Thank you all for being here. Good to be here. All right. Here's the big question from the 10,000 foot view. And let's start on the local level to begin with. What most surprised you about the recent primaries? Well, we found out that money doesn't buy local elections, that we had a, a, over a million dollars were spent in the, uh, just at the local level, not counting House candidates, congressional candidates. A million dollars were spent, and the candidates that spent the most money did not win. So the, the candidate still matters. Mm -hmm. it, you cannot, fortunately, at, at least in the primary level, <laughs> you cannot buy the elections here. You know, we talked about that before, um, before we went on air, and I had brought that point up that the, the more money you spent, the less likely you were to right. win. And then the conversation turned to, but was it how they spent their money? Well, I, I mean, Ryan had some interesting things to say on what, how she thought that they spent it, and that's really more your world. Oh, yeah. But indeed, that played out that you weren't going to win this one. Right. And what, what, what do you think made the difference? Because, you know, a lot of money was spent. It wasn't spent locally in the dis the feeling I got was the decisions on spending the money wasn't being made locally. How did you see that? I agree with you completely. I mean, I think that one of the problems that we see here was you had some, some consultants that didn't necessarily live in this area, right? And they were looking at data points and saying, okay, well, all of Pensacola looks very, very red in the data. Everyone is registered Republican. And unless you really live here and you really have an understanding of how we, it breaks down even by neighborhoods and precincts, you don't really have a good idea of what those numbers really are. The data doesn't reflect the vote. So, I mean, for example, in East Hill and Cordova Park, you have a lot of people who are registered Republicans, but they are more moderate. They're more on, they're more left-leaning and, and they typically will vote blue. So, you know, when you're, when you have these decisions being made out of Tampa or out of Tallahassee or Orlando, what they're doing is they're saying, okay, well, this is all this. So if this is this, then we're going to send out a Trump mailer. Well, right. that ends up killing you. Trump and, so, and dolphins. Trump and dolphins, right, right, yes. Right, right. Yes. <laughs> that ends up hurting you there where, you know, if you know the neighborhoods and you know how it works, I mean, the Trump stuff will play better, I think, on the west side than it does in, say, Cordova Park. So it's just, it's a mat and, and on, on, on paper, they all look the same. It's right. this, it looks exactly the same. So you really do have to have a local flavor. You have to have some, some insight into what your district really does look like. And I think, too, to what Lisa's point was, is that, you know, a lot of these were unknowns. And so they also thought, well, I can spend the money and I will be fine. What they didn't realize is you have to go door to door. You can't just buy name ID. And where you see the most money spent were the least known candidates. So, you know, that, that they didn't necessarily win because they, they spent the money saying, okay, well, I'm going to go and put out a bunch of mail. But people get so much mail, they, they throw them away. It's the, the candidate that comes to your door and introduces himself to you and says, you know, this is who I am. This is what I stand for. That's the touch that matters. And that's the hard thing to do. Yeah, and the thing that I saw, and, and Travis, I know you could come in on it too, is, is some of the candidates seem like they lost control of their campaigns. Mm -hmm. 
that, that they didn't really know why they they wanted to get elected, but they didn't know why they wanted to get elected, and, and they sold themselves out to their consultants. Yeah, one of the hardest things to do as a consultant is balance the the art and science of how do you win a campaign with who exactly is this candidate. Right. Candidates, voters have gotten really smart about sniffing out people who aren't authentic, whether that's a, a local election for a city council or county commission, all the way up to president. You know, there were many voters that made the difference in the presidential race who saw one candidate, Donald Trump, as very authentic and saw Hillary Clinton as less than authentic. That matters at the local level just as much, if not more so. The other point I think that Ryan was alluding to is the blocking and tackling of campaigns are still the same, whether it's the state house or the county courthouse or the White House. You have to have a message that resonates with the voters. You have to deliver that message consistently. And you have to just do the work of campaigning, whether mm -hmm. that's barnstorming the country in a, in a jet, crisscrossing uh, uh, swing states for the Electoral College, or whether that's just banging on every door that, that you need to in your precincts. You have to do the work um, to, um, you know, to, to win those votes. So, One thing I wanted to ask, you were talking about mail. I mean, we were bombarded with mail, and I'm just sitting here, I, I said to my wife, I said, you know, in today's digital world, does, does direct mail still work? I guess it does, huh? Well, consultants well, make a lot of money off of mail. Yeah, I mean, and 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 you look. You know, this is cynic, the cynical side of Rick Outson. But I'm sitting there, and the and the some people knew their candidate had one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Well, how can the, I'm thinking that possibly. The consultant's saying, that's $120,000. My candidate might not make it out of the primary. I got to be sure when I spend that 120 because I can get my money out of that. You know? well, as, as a consultant that actually... <laughs> not that you would ever do that. <laughs> I'm not ever saying that. That's true. Our, 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 we, we, I pride myself on being the type of consultant that says, here's how you win. Hopefully there's some direct mail involved. If right. not, here's some great TV uh, uh, production folks. And but some print ads. And, 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 and of course, <laughs> of course. And all my ads, right? Print right. Print right. Ads. But when, when it comes to direct mail, when you look at these district races, where you really are talking about, you know, five or six precincts, sometimes even less, Less. direct mail some of the digital targeting you can really get really granular with um, with your voters and make sure for instance if if you're in a Republican primary you don't need to spend money communicating to Democrats because they can't vote in your primary most of the time um, if you are trying to turn out a certain segment of the electorate whether that's women or minorities you can target those voters through mail similar way you can target those through digital and online ads. With television, it gets a little more difficult. It's still possible, but um, just the cost effectiveness of direct mail. And, and a lot of folks are watching Netflix now or they're right. streaming, right. streaming WSRE on their computers as opposed yeah, that's, to that's uh, Unfortunately, though, they didn't, they didn't use that wisely. I mean, as just a reader, when you, those, they, they tried to outdo each other. So you, they could get down to that granular level. They knew who was in that house. But instead of targeting that message, they went with a very uh, stereotype message. So if you were in a very red district or neighborhood, they went all in, all Trump. And the message was not a local message. It wasn't about local issues. It was it, it was things like Nancy Pelosi is trying to, you know, bring immigrants into your neighborhood. Dolphins it, it, support it, me. Right. Yeah. It had nothing to do with the issues that impacted local residents. Well, and the other the other thing that I think that happened in this election that that surprised a lot of us in the past. Uh, two thirds of the votes are usually cast before the day of the uh, before the actual voting day. We had over 50 percent of the votes were cast that day, and we had a lot of candidates that had no ground game. They didn't man the precincts. They did. They, and they, you talk about blocking and tackling. You got to have someone at every precinct because obviously 50 percent of the voters did not know who they wanted to vote for. So if somebody was on their way in and somebody said vote for Travis Peterson or vote for Ryan Wiggins. You know, it, 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 it had an impact. And we had a lot of precincts, they, you know, they didn't have someone saying vote for the candidates. And, and that, I think, was a huge error uh, on a lot of the candidates' fault because it's, it's, it's um, as I always say, people, they want to hold the office, but they don't, and they want to get elected, but they don't want to run. And yeah. if you can't do it the day of, you know, it's just a big part well, of it. Campaign, sorry. I was going to say, let's be honest, running for office is hard work. It is. No, it no. is grueling, whether you're knocking on doors in the heat of August or going to seven different candidate forums a, a week. It's a lot of hard work. And so 
kudos to the candidates that stepped up. We did have a, a lot of we great did. candidates this year um, who really showed a lot of, of potential and, and did show a lot of work ethic and some good ideas for our community. Um, but the, the voting at the, the voters at the, the poll workers is an important point. Most of the voters were going to vote for a gu gubernatorial mm -hmm. candidate. That's the big ticket right. that most voters were going for unless they knew a candidate running for county commission, a can candidate running for mayor. So those down ballot races, that ground game really can make up, you know, the difference in a close race. And what I was going to say too is when you're running a campaign, you have to remember that it is a marathon and not a sprint. So a lot of people go and they go gung ho right at the beginning, but, but they don't follow through. Right. So I mean, mail does matter, if, but timing of mail matters. It's a strategy behind that matters. You chase the absentees. You know, when you're door knocking, you don't go to every door. You go to the doors of the four and five star voters. You want to hit super voters. And you really want to hit the super voters who have, have gotten an absentee ballot. You know, it's, they, there's a saying that it's, it's seven touches before you really remember a person. You want to get as many touches in as you can. And that's why exactly what you were saying. You can't stop the day before the election and say, I've done all I can do. You've right. got to be at the poll. You've got that extra touch can make the difference. Right. You know, that's really scary because since the primary until now, it's been very quiet. Yeah, it has mm -hmm. been. And we're yeah. about to, to start right. early voting and it's as if, as if it, the a race was over with and yeah. I have, we've got some really big races on the table yet. I've not heard much it, at all. It's coming. It's coming. I was going to say, the sign waving will start again in about a week and a half. Uh, let, me, let me jump real quick because you brought something up and I mentioned it in the open and, and it made me kind of wonder why are some of these hyper local candidates trying to somehow paint themselves to be tied in with a national agenda? And I mean, to me, that was, I'm like, what, what does that have to do with getting my street paved or getting, you know, uh, the parks refurbished or whatever the case may be? What's the thinking behind that? The consultants, that's y'all's world. <laughs> Tribalism. <laughs> it's tribalism. I mean, you know, it's, it's one of those things, you want the things that resonate with people. It was so funny to watch mailers, and it always is, to see, you know, someone say, I'm, I'm, I'm for the, the, the build the wall. Well, we're in Pensacola. Where exactly are you going to build that wall? Like, what are we, what are we building? Is it, I mean, you know, and, but those are the things they're, they're trying to bring voters in. And, and when you're on a local level, to be honest, it's really hard to distinguish yourself from, from everyone else. I mean, typically in these local races, this is their first step into politics. They really haven't had, you know, a whole lot to, to run on at this point. So they're trying to borrow and, and steal from wherever they, they think something is popular. I mean, there was a city council race that ran on the Bayview Cross. It was right. great. I mean, he tapped, in, he tapped into a right. vein that people cared about, and sure. that was a local issue. But like I said, you know, on, on na they, they tapped into national things too. You know, build a wall or, you know, the Pelosi agenda. It's like, how is Pensacola? <laughs> You're going to have Nancy Pelosi's right. going to be weighing in on the county commission. Does she not have anything better to do? Like, what a waste of time. Well, it would liven it up if she showed up there, But right? it's tribalism. I mean, so, I mean, people people want their team to win. And it's one of the things I think is really dangerous with the way the country is going right now. It is, it isn't, we're not Americans. We are Republicans or we are Democrats. And when you lose sight of what's best for all, you get in trouble. Mm. And that's why the, these messages are coming down. They know that people are that way. They know that people are, you know, team all Republican. Like if you if you want to build a wall and Trump wants to build a wall, then I'm with you because I'm a Republican. So I think that that has a lot to do with what but do you But it didn't work. That's, it didn't. That, that it is, didn't to work. me, that was the most encouraging it thing. It was very encouraging. And, and that, that it didn't filter down. Unless you had a specific endorsement for Trump, like our congressman did, that, you know, the others, just having a photo of Donald mm -hmm. Trump Jr. did not work. Although the, the star, the star might have made a difference the star in House made a District difference. Which is unbelievable <laughs> if you think about it. That. And, and that was probably one of the more interesting races out there. And the folks that I talked to said that was, the outcome was more surprising and um, it was the Mike Hill, Rebecca Bidlack race. Right. And, and uh, I guess, Rick, by all indications, that the polls had indicated that she was leading. Um, and then Mike came out with the star thing about bringing Donald Trump's Hollywood star to Pensacola. And he, he, he eked out a win. Well, there's a, there was an undercurrent to that race that, that we in the media did not see. Uh, it started, it has surfaced, of course, we had the... Uh, the Liberty Caucus come out and, and talk about some of the underhanded things that were happening in that race. And, and there have been things posted uh, by Bidlack, Rebecca's husband, you know. But the problem was that, that we in the media were not un, unaware. And, and the problem when you're in a more rural district is there's a whole lot of back talk going in that we never heard about. And, and I think that had a, it probably had a bigger factor than we, than we know. Uh, 
And, and, and Rebecca still is a young, untried candidate, and Mike has been on the ballot uh, right. five different times. Right. He had the name so, ID going in right. that she didn't have. Right. But, you know, I, I also think with that race, too, no one really knew what was going on. I mean, Rebecca, to her credit, was trying to run a clean campaign. She did was not mm -hmm. trying to pull all of this up because she, she was, in my opinion, and still is, the best candidate for that race. But because of that, she didn't reach out for help either. So right. she wasn't going and, and letting Tallahassee know, look, this is happening right now and I'm I'm in trouble she never wanted to put off the airs that I'm in trouble she thought that that was going to hurt her I think if she had let more people know I mean I don't think the press knew no, I didn't no. know as, as a mm -hmm. Republican consultant in Pensacola I was unaware and I know that Tallahassee was unaware until it was too late mm -hmm. so I mean there is something to be said for ringing that bell when that bell needs to be rung if you're a candidate and you're in trouble and especially if they're if they're are lies being told about you or untruths being told about you or, you know, kind of some backhanded things like what was happening in that, that race. I think had she rung that bell and said, I am in trouble, people would have listened and, and it may have been a different outcome. We're going to continue this conversation in just a couple of moments. We are talking about politics in a midterm election year on this edition of In Studio on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast. We're coming right back. Welcome back. This is In Studio on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast. Our topic, politics in a midterm election year. Our guest, Ryan Wiggins, Rick Alton, Travis Peterson, and Lisa Nellison Savage. Interesting conversation here. We were talking a little bit about the local stuff. Let's move to the state, um, and then we'll come back to some of the local stuff. But, wow, the, the whole gubernatorial thing, was that a surprise? That's where I think the tribalism that you're talking about worked. Absolutely. I mean, you had Gwen Graham in the middle, who was very moderate, that I think much of the state thought really was going to take that race. And now what we're going to see is a replay of Trump and Sanders here in right. Florida. Yeah. I mean, were you surprised? I mean, what about DeSantis? I mean, did you think Putnam would, you think the race would have been closer? No, I don't. I mean, you know, I think that over the past two years, the no party affiliation, people who've registered no party affiliation has gone up by two to four percent. And that's that's a pretty big leap in two years. And what's happened is the more moderate conservatives, the more establishment conservatives have found themselves lost in a Tea Party Republican Party. And a lot of them have left. And so what happened is, is in a primary, sometimes you have to go so far to the right, so far to your base that you can't get back to the middle. And what happened here is Putnam was not at... He, when you can't out Trump Donald Trump and Donald Trump came out early and in and back to Santa's and the party is is your your dyed in the wool party and they are their Trump supporters the the base is Trump there was no way that Putnam had a chance with those people because of Trump I mean he he kept him out of it so you ended up with someone very 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 much like Trump running for governor in Florida and then I think that the Republicans the establishment Republicans over in Tallahassee were really concerned about Gwen Graham um, she she scared everybody everyone figured if she was on if, if the Democrats elected Gwen that she would probably take out DeSantis and you would have down ballot voting at that point in time and then we would probably lose the cabinet and and a lot of the Senate seats some house but a lot of the Senate seats um, they all breathed, breathed a sigh of relief, and one of the jokes was that the Democrats were never going to do something like that because she was she was more moderate. She was someone that the MPAs could get behind. She was somebody moderate conservatives and moderate Democrats could all get behind, mm -hmm. which is why the conservatives were so scared of her. Um, I don't know that they're as scared of Gillum. It'll be an interesting race. I want to hear Travis's take on that yeah. because it, it was a, it was an unusual the wave for Gillum. Mm -hmm. really happened over the last seven days. Mm -hmm. it, right. When, when you talk to the folks affiliated with the, Gra the Gwen Graham campaign, 
they knew that Gillum was surging. It was just a function of how big was that surge going to be and were they going to be able to hold on. And as it turned out, to the surprise of many people, um, myself included, um, you know, he was able to pull out, pull out the win. The other thing that's interesting in these two primaries is you had a very stark choice on the Republican primary, like Ryan mentioned, with DeSantis, sort of the Trump Republican, Adam Putnam, kind of the establishment Republican. In the Democratic primary, we had five, six candidates. Mm -hmm all of whom had a, a defined pocket of support, a, a legitimate base of support, and most of them had lots and lots of their own money to spend to build up their name ID or to expand their base. What happens, though, is you do end up with the, uh, the, the hardcore base from both parties being represented in, in this general election. Don't forget, in a, in a primary, you're talking about the most partisan of voters voting in those. And if you win 30% of your party's primary, that may only be 12% of the overall electorate. Or even in DeSantis's case, it could on, might only be 30 or 40% of the only overall electorate. You're still a long way away from 51. And so I think this, this fall is going to really play out with, like Lisa said, a real stark choice between the kind of Bernie Sanders progressive wing of the Democratic Party and the Trump wing of the Republican Party. And people in the middle are going to have a tough decision, which... Which way do they want to go? I think the other thing that, that, that I saw in it, and particularly you know watching, is is the Democratic vote was they have taken safe candidates the last couple of times in the governor's race. Mm -hmm. They took Charlie Crist, mm -hmm. they took Alex Sink, they mm -hmm. took Jim Smith, and all of them on paper were okay. Uh, most of them were fairly dull candidates mm -hmm. that didn't energize. And I think there's an element in the Republican Party, I mean the Democratic Party. That, that, and we're seeing it nationally, they mm -hmm. want to push back. They want somebody, they're not, they don't want to whimper in front of Donald Trump. They don't want to whimper. And, and whether it works or not, we don't know. Right. Yeah. You know, exactly and, right. and, but it, 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 it's, it's, it's that counterbalance to what we're seeing in the ultra, ultra, you know, uh, far right Republican group. And, 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 and then the, the Democrats are saying, hell with it. We want health, we want right. health care. We want universal health care. We, we want this, we want that. And, and, and Gillum offered him that. And, and, and interestingly enough, you know, you talk about Gwen Graham, and I think you're right. I think people on the Republican side were probably very concerned uh, about her. But at the same time, what about Philip Levine? I thought he kind of mm -hmm. offered an interesting approach to things. And, and, and um, I interviewed him for another program that I do before he announced. But he seemed to me like someone that many Republicans could have possibly, you know, you know, pulled the lever for because he was very pro-business. I mean, do you think he took some away from Graham? Well, I, I think, you know, Levine his numbers sort of collapsed. I actually think Jeff Green, who got in the That's race right. at the yeah, end and Jeff spent millions and right. millions of dollars, um, probably hurt Levine and Gwen Graham to a certain extent, more so than, than uh, any other candidate. So he, he really shook up that apple cart. And again, you have five, six legitimate candidates running in that primary. Mm -hmm. The vote share gets smaller and smaller. You're cutting the pie right. thinner and thinner each time you put in a new candidate, and it just makes it harder and harder for um, you know, a candidate to come out of the primary with kind of a mandate. We're taping the show a week prior to it actually airing, so I, I want to clarify that because of the statement I'm about to make. I saw some polls today where Gillum is actually leading DeSantis by four to six points, I guess, depending on who's it's doing the polling. It's within the margin of yeah. error, but it's, it's I, what, who Gillum has helped more than anybody is Bill Nelson. Right. I mean, Bill Nelson was struggling against Rick Scott, and the U.S. Senate vote is above the governor's vote on the ballot, and and it's it's made uh, it's going to energize. How much Gillum energizes the vote is what we still have got yet to see, because typically Democrats do not vote well in midterm mm -hmm. elections. African American vote is not very strong, and and I mean just historically, mm -hmm. this is that it, it, they don't come out big for midterm elections. Can Gillum energize them? But, it, but it's obviously already energized Bill Nelson. And to some extent, though, and I mean, what you have to be very careful at looking there um, is the Obama, the Obama theory, where, you know, it, it did energize the African-American voters to come out. But what it didn't do is get them to vote down ballot. So right, right, they, vote, right. they came in and they voted for Barack Obama and they left. Right. So it, it, it still wait. We, we still have to see how that's going to play out and how that will help the Democrats as a whole right. or whether it's just going to help Gillum. And that's why I thought the, the fact that Nelson's ahead it probably helps Nelson because his his name will be above the governor's race. Mm -hmm. But we saw that in 2008. We both, you know, Lumen mm -hmm. May mm -hmm. was running for state representative. We found the undervote 
in Lumen May's race, which is mid part of the ballot, that, that we had so many uh, African Americans voting, many of them for their first time, they were they were sort of coached, mm -hmm. check that box and yeah. you can go home, mm -hmm. right. you know, and they never did go down ballot. Mm -hmm. So you, as it works in the cabinet races and the other races, I think yeah. you're right. We, we don't know what that's going to be. Well, the thing to remember is, is since n from 1992 to 2016, there have been about five, 50 million votes cast in Florida for president over the course of those 16 years. The separation between the Democrat and Republican candidate over those 16 years, excuse me, 26 years, less than 20,000 votes. Wow. You count up all the Republican presidential votes, all the Democratic presidential votes in Florida since 1992, less than 20,000 votes separating it all. And that's, that's a true swing state. That oh, yeah. turnout <laughs> matters, candidates matter, yeah. demographics matter. You know, on paper, demographics uh, favor the Democratic nominee in this state. That's not to say it always holds true. There are a lot of questions about turnout, uh, Puerto Ricans in the, Puerto Ricans right, right. Big, in the middle part of the state and the sort of I-4 corridor uh, turned out in large numbers for Barack Obama. They tend to vote Democrat. They tend not to be as active in midterm elections. Right. And that, that's going to be, you know, we're not going to see a lot of the money being spent up here the waste because <laughs> yeah, it's, it's because in the same you know we'll see Republican TV ads up here to turn out Republican voters in the same way that in Miami and Fort Lauderdale there won't be there will be a lot of Democratic TV ads to turn out votes there the bulk of the money and the bulk of the vote 45 percent of the vote comes out of the Tampa and Orlando media markets right and you're talking three to four million dollars a week on TV there so that's uh -huh. that's that's going to be ground zero that you know sort of the model is you know if you're a Democrat, run up the score in South Florida. Don't get killed up here and battle for the, the center part of the state. The Republicans, you flip the, flip the model, and it's, it yes. still comes down to the you know, Tampa, Orlando media markets. And you're looking this year at an influx of about 100,000 Puerto Ricans into right. the Orlando right. area. So, and, they're, and they are very angry with Donald Trump. So, mm -hmm. right. I mean, that, that, that plays heavily. They're, you're going to see the Republicans playing hard in Jacksonville and mm -hmm. North Florida. Um, and trying to and trying to get the vote turned out there, they're going to be battling for I four. I think they struggle with I four because of that. I mean, they may have some play in Tampa. Even ta even that said, Tampa Republicans tend to be more moderate Republicans. Um, I four is a very moderate area. That's why it's always in play. So yeah. it'll be very interesting. I mean, the play usually for Republicans is try to get Miami Dade and then try to get the Panhandle in North Florida. It, that's going to be tough to do this year because of the influx of Puerto Ricans and and Orlando. But the legislature, in your guess, would probably stay in Republican hands. Yes, I think it'll probably stay. I th we may lose some Senate seats, and we may lose a House seat or two, but I think that it, it stays. So w w what does that look like? I mean, that, that would almost be a shock to the system, wouldn't it, to have someone as to the left as Gillum and then a, a pretty right, mm -hmm. center of right legislature, legislature that we've had for quite some time. What does that look like in Tallahassee? You're <laughs> going to get me in trouble here, but I will tell you, sometimes that's better. I mean, sometimes mm -hmm. when you have, you have to have, the system is meant to work with balance. So, I mean, when one party's in charge of everything, Floridians suffer, whether that's Republicans or Democrats. You have to have the voices of everyone heard. So sometimes it works well when you have a Republican-led legislature and a Democrat in the governor's office, or vice versa. You know, I mean, that, that, that is better for Floridians in the long run because it forces compromise. You can't have strong policies on either side there. It, it forces the system to work how it's designed to work. So, I mean... I don't know that we will have that. We will have to see. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that it's necessarily a bad thing. And I know that from a Republican standpoint, they're looking at Gillum and saying, you know what, he's beatable. So, mm -hmm. you know, even if DeSantis can't beat him this year, we'll get him in four years. And we'll, maybe we'll have it, maybe at that point in time, you know, maybe you don't have the the Trump thundercloud over everyone's head. Maybe there's something else there at that point in time that, that, that does energize Republicans back to the sense of normalcy, back to you know the, the conservative party that they know and that they know how to work with them. Fascinating conversation about politics in a midterm election year. We'll continue this conversation in just a couple of moments. This is in studio on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast, coming right back.
This is in studio on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast. We are discussing politics in a midterm election year with journalist Rick Altson and Lisa Nellison Savage and political strategist Travis Peterson and Ryan Wiggins. Let's talk a little bit about the attorney general race because we did have a local um, politician from, from the Pensacola area competing in that, uh, Frank White against uh, Ashley Moody. And um, your take on that? I think Ashley is a, is a solid candidate. I mean, I, I'm comfortable with her going into this general election. She has a lot of experience behind her. She is more on the moderate side. Um, I think that that brings people, it makes people more comfortable with her. She's got a softer approach. The things she's running on, I think are things that we see as a state that we, we need mental health reform, that sort of thing. So I think I think that she's she's gonna do well. I think that, sh that that she is not polarizing, and I think that that's really important when you're looking into a general election. Were you surprised Frank took that jump? I mean, because it, it seemed to me, by all accounts, he was having a pretty successful career in the legislature, could have certainly st probably stuck around, but, it, you know, been term limited out. And Were you surprised that he took such a, a, a different route, so to speak? I, I was. I mean, I think, you know, he, he was just really sort of getting his feet wet as being a rep, and he had... You know, he'd done some good things, he'd misstepped a little bit, he was in that learning process. Uh, I think he saw in the consultants help him see uh, a, a, an angle if he came in ultra, ultra conservative that that might be the thing that would work. Uh, the problem that I saw with, with it is that uh, you had, you know, other than a handful of sheriffs up here, every sheriff in the state was backing him. Uh, Pam Bondi her. was backing her. him. Backing her. Yeah. Ba backing her, I'm sorry, right. backing her. Pam Bondi was backing her. You know, she just she was, and her qualifications were different. And uh, I think that that I was surprised when I saw polls coming back showing that that Frank had a lead because the, the polling that we were doing was showing just the opposite. And I and so you wonder uh, again my mistrust of not y'all <laughs> but some consultants <laughs> and how they how they work their candidates. Uh, uh, it, it was it was concerning to me, and uh, we didn't really see the real battle up here. The real mm -hmm. battle was in the middle part of the state, and Ashley Moody was just tearing him apart, mm -hmm. you know. And he was getting heavy criticism from the media there for some of some stretches that they had done and some of their advertising, and uh, so it, it, we didn't really get a full picture of what was happening. The rest of the state was not surprised. Mm -hmm. The Panhandle was surprised because we only got a piece of what was really going on. And I think that that's another uh, example of how Florida really is almost four or five states in one. Yeah. And Ashley Moody, coming from the Tampa Bay area, just had a built-in advantage because her home turf is 10, 12, 15, 20 times the size of Frank right. White's home turf. She just market. automatically started ahead. Yeah, was a judge. She was a judge. Exactly. Was a prosecutor. Right, right, right. In addition to the resume, just the media market and, you know, Having having that kind of a, a jump start. Blue key at Florida. I mean, she was you know she she was part of that that whole culture there. So mm -hmm. we didn't get a good picture up here. I think right. of that race. I would agree with that. What about the congressional <clears throat> race, Lisa? What did you make of that? I mean, obviously uh, Congressman Gates won the Republican nomination, but I mean uh, Chris Dosev certainly gave him a, a pretty good run. I mean, certainly during the, the the campaign. I'm not sure the results are reflected per se, but but yeah. ultimately he Chris was all in for sure. Well, we were actually a little surprised that he didn't do better than he did. He did not even win the Panhandle. He didn't he didn't win Escambia County, which mm -hmm. we really thought was going to be a shoe in for that. You know, so heavy, heavily military. He really. Um, put invested a lot in that. Um, that was a really negative campaign. I think that turned a lot of people off. I mean, on both sides, um, you know, Gates was the shoe in there. I think we all knew that from the beginning, but we we did think it was going to be a little uh, of a closer race than it was. Well, well, the problem was there's no room right of Matt Gates. Yeah. You know, and 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 Dosef was trying to, at times it appeared, and this is is that. That Trump loves him better if he knew him better, mm. you know. And, and but, but Matt had the president's endorsement. Mm -hmm. Matt has played that card aggressively, uh, and in a in a in a district, particularly among Republicans, mm -hmm. that is still an important card to play. So it, it it was hard to say that you're more conservative than Matt, mm -hmm. you know. Now if, if 
you know, and he would never do this, but there was room on the other side of Matt, but there was not a candidate playing that card. Well, and Matt was also getting a ton of free earned media. I oh, mean, right, you know, right. He's on Fox News every single day. Right. That's not mm -hmm. something you can compete with. Right. So, I mean, it didn't matter how much money Dosef threw at it, that the red meat conservatives that tend to vote in primaries watch Fox News all day. Right. And, and Matt is on there. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I think that, and, and Matt also knows how to campaign the area. I mean, you know, he knows that north of I-10 is where his base is. You know, he knows that, you know, it, the inside of Pensacola and and the insides of these cities are not necessarily where his, his core support is. His support is north of that. And so he knew how to campaign that. He knew how to work that. He was very strategic in how he campaigned. Right. And then he also, like I said, he had all this earned media. I mean, it was mm -hmm. also how Trump won. I mean, Trump was on the news every right. day. Well, you can't mm -hmm. compete with, right. with right. free press. Right, right, right. right. Well, talking about Trump for a second and talking about all the folks that want to, you know, hitch their horse to his wagon, so to speak. Um, regardless of how you feel, there continues to be a um, fair amount of negative issues coming out about him in his personal life. And, you know, um, you know, just recently the book and uh, so on and so forth. At what point? Which book? Yeah, well, lots of <laughs> well, it's well, the new book. He's been well, great it, for publishers. <laughs> exactly. so, um, you got people reading it. <laughs> but but w at what point does it... In, in, in being in a conservative area like we are, and and a lot of um, you know, kind of a more or less religious area, mm -hmm. re conservatively religious. Area, at what point do people say, "I don't want to be associated with that"? Maybe I agree with him politically. Maybe I agree with political ideology on it, but I can't live with some of the other things. Does I don't that think happen? there is a point that that happens. Again, it goes back to the tribalism, and I mean, a lot of these voters are also one issue voter. So they're, they are running on pro-life or they are running on Second Amendment or they're, and, and they're not willing, regardless of what their faith says and regardless of what Donald Trump may be, they're not willing to compromise on the issues that they, that they believe strongly in. I mean, you know, during, during the last election, they were saying, you know, we're not electing a Sunday school teacher. Well, but shouldn't he reflect kind of what you believe in? No, we're not electing it. We're electing a president, and he is strong on this and this and this and this and this. So I don't think that you ever get to a point where the Republican base is not going to back one of their own. And I don't see a Republican candidate running against Trump because Trump runs the RNC now. So, I mean, there's not, the money isn't going to be there. The support isn't going to be there from inside the party. Whoever runs against Trump would have to run as a third-party candidate, and I don't see him pulling the base away from that for tribalism reasons. I think the other thing is to, to note about Trump is, is he didn't cause this, he's a symptom. He mm -hmm. is the outcome of this slow degradation of our politics. You know, there were people that for years said Barack Obama wasn't a citizen, he was a Muslim, he wasn't a Christian, all of which was untrue and he professed his faith and talked about it, not as openly as others, but you know, there's been this, this slow, steady drumbeat toward kind of an amoral view of our politics. And with someone like Trump, he's not the first flawed president. No, you know, he no. is the most flawed president. But <laughs> well, I think there are those that would argue <laughs> against that, and you know, I mean, I mean, there was there, 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 there was a guy back terrible. in the uh, back fair, in the early '90s fair, that might. Uh, <laughs> but that's but that's a great point, right? So yeah. so the challenge is the, the point is. Democrats and Republicans have been making those sacrifices, have been making those decisions for a long time. It's, I think it's just been drawn into sharp relief now with Trump and, and his use of the media and some of his previous personal history as well as some of his business history. So we need to, as, as bad as we think it's, it's gotten, um, we were kind of on this path already. Yeah. Well, and more than that, he the voters voted for anti-Washington. They did not Correct. want Washington, and he did that really, really well. He continues to do that really well. That's what they're going to continue to vote for, you know, to your point mm -hmm. about the degradation already. Right. I, I, but the thing that I'm encouraged about is is that it didn't translate to the local level. And I, I keep coming back to it because locally people still cared about who the person was that was running. Mm -hmm. And, and they, they, they threw all the red meat they could. They went after that editorial cartoonist from that daily newspaper that was <laughs> fake news. It was part of that Beltway owned company, you know, that hated their, that candidate's immigration policy for county commission. And, you know, and we saw the same, similar things happening over in, in Santa Rosa mm -hmm. County. Uh, and then, you know, we saw, you know, this, this mm -hmm. it didn't, people still cared, 
about who the candidate was mm -hmm. and whether this person could represent me on the local level. I hope we can hold on to that. That was, that was the question going into, the biggest question I had going into the vote on, on August 28th was, have we got to this level you know, we had, you know, and, and obviously we had one race that got out of control, mm -hmm. the, the, the district one house Republican primary, but the rest of them, you know, people attacking each other on Facebook and attacking the media on Facebook or, or whatever didn't work. People still cared about the race and the candidate. And I think that's to Escambia County's credit, Santa Rosa County's credit. That, that they haven't bought into it at, at that level. Well, and the same trends historically and demographic, demographically that have led to the rise of the Trump wing of the Republican Party or the Bernie Sanders wing of the Democratic Party, this intense distrust of the establishment has also yielded a, a very sort of strong trend towards localism. Let's look for local solutions. Mm -hmm. Let's not right, worry right. about yeah. Washington Silicon? fixing I mean, it for Silicon, us or Tallahassee right. fixing it for us. Let's fix it ourselves, whether it's civic, right. whether it's right. some of the neighborhood activism that right. you're seeing. It's not always pretty, right? We don't always get along, but it's solutions being sought and debated within the context of, of our local community. And so I think with a lot of the candidates, you saw that sort of community spirit, uh, even though they were competing for votes, by and large, there were a lot of really solid uh, well-meaning people running for office and I think you know we need to engender that localist kind of feel particularly right. in a community like Pensacola where we we do have a lot of potential. But I, I'll say this too though going to Rick's point you know there's a saying all politics is local well that's a great saying but it's not always true. Right, right, so right, what, right. What, I mean, what you see here too is you have a chance at the local level to actually get to know your candidates right, mm -hmm. right. where you don't really have that chance so much at a statewide or a national level so as much as I was encouraged too that maybe that did not bleed all the way down I think it's different because you have your candidates are people you know they are your neighbors right. when you're looking at local races you know who these people well, are and if you don't that. know them your neighbor knows right, them. Right. Right. I'm going to continue this conversation in just a couple of moments. And speaking of local, I want to come back and talk about what's going to be, I think, one of the more interesting races coming up here, and that's who's going to be the next mayor of Pensacola. We'll have that conversation when In Studio continues on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast. We're coming right back. Welcome back. This is in studio on WSRE television, PBS for the Gulf Coast. Our topic politics in a midterm election year. We're joined by journalist Rick Alson and Lisa Nellison Savage and political strategist Ryan Wiggins and Travis Peterson. Okay, let's talk about one that's going to be real interesting in Pensacola. Who is going to be our next mayor? We had a pretty interesting group of candidates run for the in, in, in the primary. So let me ask you this question first. Of all of those candidates, which one most surprised you of how well they did? Well, I, I think what, what jumped out was David Mayo came on very well. Uh, he had, he'd come out fairly strong, and then when Brian Spencer got into the race, it kind of nibbled away at him. Uh, and and I really feel that, that what we what we saw the day of the election is that David Mayo was the anti Grover Robinson, anti Brian Spencer candidate. Mm -hmm. They wanted someone that wasn't a politician. Right. That, that had, uh, not that the other candidates don't have strong beliefs, and, but, but he came, he's such a principled person. Mm -hmm. it, it, and his life story is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. I mean, overcoming paralysis at a very teen, when he was a teenager. Uh, 
Uh, it just didn't have enough oomph to get up there. Uh, every, all the other candidates finished kind of how we thought they were going to finish, mm -hmm. uh, I think. But, uh, but Mayo came on a lot stronger than we thought. Uh, and I think that's probably, to me, was probably the biggest surprise. Yeah. I would agree with that. You know, he just had this enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. You know, you couldn't help but feel like, hey, this guy really loves Pensacola. And, uh, you know, some people are able to communicate that and other people are not. You know, Mayo just was able to really communicate that. I do think Rick's point about the late entry of Brian Spencer did shake up the dynamics of that race a, right. a good Absolutely bit. Absolutely did. Right. Absolutely Absolutely did. did. What do you think Brian waited to kind of the last minute? Well, he waited very much the very much last minute. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. Literally last minute. Yeah. I mean, I was writing the article yeah. that there were no surprises <laughs> registered that day. And I'm getting a phone call. No, he's in, you know, and I'm going. He's in. He was in my office the day before saying he wasn't going to run. So, yeah, I, I, you know, I think Brian, I think, what Brian, what Brian has told me directly was that it was an opportunity that he would have regretted not having run. That this was his opportunity to run. If he didn't run, whoever was elected would have two terms. And, and, and so he, for him, he felt like this was a once in a lifetime opportunity to do it. And I think, I think he was torn about it. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, that's what pulled the, pulled the trigger for him. Let me ask you this. Were you, because we did an end of the year show back right. in December of 2017 and had a round table of journalists and we talked a little bit about, you know, who was going to run for mayor of Pensacola. And I think the, most of the panel agreed that uh, Mayor Hayward would throw his hat in the ring one more time. Were you surprised that he did not? I wasn't at all. I think that there were signs um, leading up to that that he had, you know, set his sights on somewhere else. I mean, it was an, it would have been an uphill battle. There was so much, uh, the community is different now than it was mm -hmm. eight years ago and even four years ago. So I don't think it would have been as easy of a win. No, that's not to say that he wouldn't have won it. I, I don't right. know that. But it wouldn't have been as easy. And I don't think it was as, as fun anymore either. It's hard. You, you can't underestimate the challenge of being the the first mayor under mm -hmm. the strong mayor form of government. Um, well, you I, ran his I, campaign. I worked with Mayor right, Hayward right. on his first campaign, worked at the city for a, a couple of years, and there was a big transition. It was a transition for the community. It was a transition for city employees and, and, and the, the folks affiliated with the city, uh, just the culture and for the, certainly for the city council, understanding how this new system of government works. And obviously it wasn't perfect, right. um, and there's still some things to be worked out. Uh, but, you know, I, you can't help but think that those first three or four years uh, were really tough. And, and do you have three terms in you after that? Right. And, and I'll tell you this, too. I mean, I think that when you are the first one, you're still figuring out how this all works. And I think that you have to look at it as I, that is the executive branch now and the right. council is right. the legislative branch now. I don't think the council has yet figured out that they're the legislative branch. And I think that... Ashton figured out he was the executive branch, but as the executive branch, you have three obligations there. You've got to bring money in from Tallahassee, you've got to run the city, and you've also got to be the one who goes to all the ribbon cuttings and you're, you know, you're, right. you have to do all the celebratory things too. I think Ashton did really well in Tallahassee. I knew, I saw it. I mean, I know he did really well in Tallahassee. And I think he tried really hard at the celebratory stuff too. It's, it's the running the city. And I think that at some point in time, and I'm hoping either one of the, the mayoral candidates, I hope they surround themselves by good people. I hope they realize they can't do the, it all. I think Ashton tried very hard to do it all. And when you're trying to do it all, you, you, can't, you can't be in three places at one time. So I think that you, know, you need to have a deputy just like you have a lieutenant governor who may go handle those celebratory things while you are handling you know, Tallahassee. Or you, and you have a good chief of staff or city administrator who is, who is the one in charge of running the city and they answer to you, but you have to learn how to delegate. And I think that there were times in this administration that Ashton struggled figuring out how to delegate that. As you take a look at the two candidates, uh, Grover Robinson, Brian Spencer, kind of break down the strengths and weaknesses of, of each. Me? <laughs> I, I, I think, you know, you look at, at both of them are, are practice politicians. Uh, I think that, uh, let, let's, we'll take Grover first. Grover's six term, I mean, three term county commissioner. He was chairman of the county commission during the BP oil spill, really was one of the engineers of uh, the restore process, really played a big part in that. Uh, I think, uh, the, and, and Grover has not ever been afraid of a town hall meeting. I mean, he has held town hall meetings 
when people at Olive Road were upset about drainage, he's been on Pensacola Beach, Grover's never shied away from a town hall meeting. Uh, Grover's uh, weakness, as I see it, is Grover's not necessarily the best listener, as many politicians aren't. Uh, he's got, he's got a, a one flaw that I see that, that jumps out that's going to give him problems, is that uh, the county commission had voted to remove the Confederate flag from the Civic Center. He was the, the guy who brought it back up uh, in the motion that, that he got passed was that it would be over the Civic Center as long as the city flew the flag. So once we got the city to drop the flag, then it came down. But he brought back the issue at a time where Santa, Escambia County could have been leading the country mm -hmm. it, on the Confederate flag issue. Uh, so pluses and minuses that is there. Plus he's also old Pensacola, has very strong roots in the east side of town. That gives him a strength. Brian is brilliant. Brian is uh, Duke, Tulane, probably a, a very creative urban planner. Uh, the, uh, he's been president of, of, the, of the Pensacola City Council. The problem is that's no longer, being a member of the Pensacola City Council is not a stepping stone because of the, of the problems the council has had over the last two, two terms. Uh, Brian's issues, as I see it, is that Brian hasn't done town hall meetings. Mm -hmm. He hasn't in, in, in he is now running and meeting people that he never met before. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that, you know, can Brian find a base to run off of? I, ironically, the last poll we did, uh, uh, Brian beat Grover in District 4, which is around by uh, Tahar, and Grover beat Brian in District 6, which is Brian's <laughs> district of the city council. So it's, I, I think it's Grover's to lose. I think Grover's got a huge edge. But uh, I think what I'm seeing uh, is that, that Brian's group is working really, really hard. So I think it's going to narrow down. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I think that, that uh, both of them have weaknesses. Both of them are very good people. Very, very, uh, I think people dis discount Grover thinking that he's not as, as uh, uh, innovative. But I saw Grover do very inventive th innovative things with the BP stuff. Uh, and Brian's not bad with people. I just don't know why they never did. But the mayor quit doing town hall meetings, and I think that spilled over. I'm really getting tight on time. So in I'm about sorry. 45 seconds, let me just get each one of you kind of just give me a, a wrap up on what we can look forward to politically as we move forward and finish this year out. Well, I'm going to finish on the mayor's race. Brian Spencer and Grover Robinson have two di very different visions for the office of the mayor. Um, Grover Robinson has sort of a, a collaborative get together and figure out where we want to go. Brian Spencer has a, here's my vision, come with me. Right. Those are two very different leadership styles and I think the voters are gonna have to have a, an interesting choice to make in that race. About 30 seconds, Ryan. I was gonna say, I, I'll look at it from a Tallahassee and a national perspective. I think that it's gonna be really interesting to see where the parties go. I think that we are right now so divided that th they can't survive. It can't keep going the way it's going right now. And so I think it's gonna to continue to be interesting to see who wins out. Who wins the battle, the Tea Party or the establishment? Who wins the battle, you know, the, the Bernies or, you know, the establishment on, on, on the left? So that is gonna be, I think, the most interesting thing to watch over the next four years. Lisa. You know, I'm going to go um, with Travis here, the mayor's race. It's the most important thing, I think, to our city. What, what That will decide our future for the next four years. I think they're both really genuinely good men who care about the city. They might have different uh, directions they want to go, but they care and they're in it for, from what I've seen, the residents. Rick, turnout. I want to see what the turnout's going to be. I think we're going to break records for, for midterm election and turnout. In Escambia County, probably statewide. I think there's more interest in these races than we've ever had. No, and I think we're going to see a huge turnout. What that means, I don't know yet. <laughs> but we're going to have a huge turnout. Who's going to turn out? Exactly. I don't know who, but they will. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, I know you guys will continue to cover it with the N Weekly and also with the Pensacola News Journal. And, of course, there will be various forums and whatnot coming up, particularly with the mayoral race. Mm -hmm. I know I think you're working on yes, one. I know the Panhandle Tiger Bay Club is also working on one. I believe that one has already been scheduled uh, in, in October. And let me just say this, too. I, I want to make it clear. I, I, 
try my very best to make this as balanced as we possibly can. Ryan here is uh, tends to be center of right and work with a lot of Republicans. Uh, Travis, on the other hand, uh, no apologies about that, but works for, for <laughs> Democrats and whatnot. Uh, Rick and Lisa, they are uh, journalists. And uh, me, what are you going to say? I mean, uh, my day job's involved in Wall Street, and then I work for PBS. Figure that one out. <laughs> <laughs> and so we try to keep it down the middle uh, as much as we possibly can here. So I hope no one took offense or, or anything along those lines because it was not intended for that to be the case at all, but just a, more or less an analysis to see what was going on. And uh, anyway, hope you enjoyed it. And the two of you hopefully are going to come back and join us in December. We're going to try to put together something like we did last year with our end of the year program and take a look at all the news stories. And it's always kind of interesting to look back and, and see what happens and how our community evolves over time. And um, of course, I think it's going to be extremely interesting and we'll have a lot to talk about mm -hmm. in, 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 in many, many ways. That being said, we hope you'll continue to watch all of our programs here on WSRE PBS for the Gulf Coast. In this particular one, we've been discussing politics in the midterm election year. Our guests have been Travis Peterson. He is the owner and lead strategist of Impact Campaigns. Ryan Wiggins has also joined us. She is the owner and chief strategist for Full Contact Strategies. Rick Alton is the owner and the publisher of the In Weekly newspaper and Rick's blog, and he's also a, a newly minted novelist show we say. And Lisa Nelson Savage is the executive editor of the Pensacola News Journal. By the way, this program will be available soon online at WSRE.org and it's also going to be flying around YouTube as well. So feel free to share on the various social media sites. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I certainly hope you enjoy the broadcast. Wish you all the very best. Take wonderful care of yourself and we'll see you soon.